Dear colleagues, dear colleagues, now we have to start. So, our today's speaker, Professor Boris Gasparov, is so widely known scholar in linguistics, literary theory, and literary criticism, and in musicology. So it's no use to, to speak about him long. Uh, and to use the musicological metaphor, he is a one-man orchestra who can play different instruments and pieces from different epochs and cultures. He's at home in Russian linguistics, Sassurian tradition, in Russian literature from Pushkin, Pasternak, and medieval Russian epic, The Tale of Igor's Campaign. I name only the books which were devoted to those subjects. And we will, would, uh, could continue the list. For the last years, in the core of his interest, we find European Romanticism and its philosophical basis. And today's lecture will be devoted to the issues of cognitive appropriation of reality and communication and self-communication problems. Boris Gasparov is Professor Emeritus of Columbia University, honorary doctor of the University of Stockholm. He was teaching at the most prestigious universities in the USA, Germany, and Finland, and stood at the origins of a new university in St. Petersburg the High School of Economics. However, here for us uh, in Tartu, Boris Gasparov is foremost ours. For 14 years, he had worked at the, at, at the University of Tartu, and at that time as a linguist and colleague of Yuri Lotman at the Department of Russian Literature, Language and Literature. I had the privilege to be a student of him in, in the classes of Russian syntax, and was, uh, was uh, a witness of his transmission from language studies to the literary studies. Uh, was following his first papers on the Master and Margarita, uh, the 12th uh, by Alexander Bloch, and still remember the strong impression of these lectures and uh, presentations. Uh, we are looking uh, forward to today's lecture. So, dear Professor Gasparov, you are welcome back to your university. The floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, I, I want to say that this is an overwhelming uh, opportunity for me to speak um, uh, even though uh, through the computer uh, in the uh, aula of Start University, which has uh, so many memories, um, holds so many memories for me. And my greetings to many friends uh, who I believe are present um, at this conference. I'm very sorry of being unable um, to, um, to be there in person. But um, I hope we will, um, we will have um, an opportunity to have a discussion on screen in the end of my lecture. Also, today is uh, when I am doing this recording of my lecture, um, is uh, February 24th, and it is a terrible day, just a... Uh, an hour or two ago, I learned the terrible news about the beginning of the war. I know how people in Estonia feel about that. Uh, frankly, I uh, I am very upset uh, at, at this moment. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's try to do our best, nevertheless. Uh, ironically, what I uh, would uh, speak, uh, will speak today, um, is about the uh, confrontational uh, aspect of dialogism. Uh, and uh, I realize that it sounds pretty paradoxical in today's context. But um, uh, uh, let's not to be too overwhelmed by the events of one day. 
Anyway, what I want to, uh, to speak about is the uh, re relation of uh, the concepts of uh, uh, semiosphere and dialogism by Yuri Mikhailovich Lotman to <clears throat> certain uh, intellectual events, uh, controversies, um, arguments that happened on the turn of the 19th century, to be precise, in late 1790s, and uh, signified the beginning of uh, Romanticism. Um, but first I want to reiterate uh, the uh, principal ideas of uh, uh, Yuri Mikhailovich in uh, in that his historical context. Mm, of course, there is no um, need to remind uh, to this uh, audience the content of his concept, but I want to, uh, to show uh, uh, briefly an evolution of Lockman's thought as it, um, as it developed from the early 60s through the 80s, um, which has led uh, to this concept. As we all know, the first decade of the Tartar Moscow School, including Lotman's uh, works in its framework, uh, went under the um, paradigm of structural linguistics and structural semiotics, you know, which considered uh, cultural behavior, beginning with language itself, but then uh, then all uh, facets of behavior, uh, of human behavior in the facets, in the framework of a culture as language. And language understood um, um, uh, under the premises of structural linguistics, um, and namely um, as a code, uh, which uh, is supposed to share to be shared at least uh, overwhelming majority of the uh, competence uh, built in the code and it has to be shared uh, for all by all their participants though their uh, uh, competence in that language enables their behavior that is their speech and uh, this, uh, this principle applies, as you well, known, uh, well know, uh, to uh, language itself as to any cultural uh, languages. Mm, you know, the culture in at large is understood as a system of systems. That is a conglomeration, uh, a conglomeration of different cultural languages, which certainly uh, find themselves in certain relations with each other. Well, uh, we all know uh, that how much this uh, approach has uh, has done for bringing together different domains of uh, of uh, studies in anthropology, in uh, art, literature, linguistics linguistics uh, in all, uh, all domains of the humanities. At the same time, they posed uh, one, uh, one question to which people didn't pay much, uh, much attention in the beginning because um, everyone was inspired by the novelty of this comprehensive approach, but which started to, um, uh, uh, to come to, for, to the foreground uh, as time evolved and uh, the studies uh, in that structural paradigm accumulated. The question is that if uh, the, um, uh, the cultural speech or linguistic speech for that matter is a secondary derivative um, a phenomenon uh, which is based on the rules of the language itself, then how new meaning uh, can be brought out uh, uh, under this activity? And I mean the genuinely new meaning and not just uh, new combinations of the same elements and the same rules uh, um, done in accordance to the stable rules of the language. If we always abide by the structural frame, all we do is manipulations or recombinations within this frame. How to break away from that? How to achieve something which is 
new, unexpected, unpredicted, unpredictable or unpredicted um, under the auspices of the structural approach. That question was uh, put uh, in front of the uh, European semiotics and uh, in the second half of the 60s, I would say, with all its sharpness. Uh, and uh, Yuri Mikhailovich was one of the first, or perhaps the first, uh, among the uh, East European uh, semioticians who felt uh, this, uh, the significance of this, uh, of this problem, of this dilemma of how you, uh, by using the rules, how you break away from that to create something new. <clears throat> Uh, we know that in uh, French semiotics and uh, eventually in French American uh, semiotics, this question was answered with a radical uh, overthrowing, over, uh, overthrowing of the structuralist paradigm uh, and uh, the declaration um, of the prevalence of the initiative of the speaking subject in creating meaning and interpreting and interpreting meaning. Uh, the death of the author, proclaimed by Roland Barthes, um, put, uh, proclaimed the end of the uh, understanding in which, uh, according to which the text as it created by, uh, by the author. The text is inbuilt meaning, which has to be deciphered, decoded by uh, its recipient. Now, uh, uh, now it uh, has become clear that our interpretation of the text uh, uh, comes to the foreground and there are many interpretations, as many as, uh, as there are interpreters of it. And this is how the new meaning uh, arises. Lotman's answer was uh, more moderate uh, I, uh, to, to, this, uh, to this problem. I would say that uh, uh, to anticipate his later uh, terms, that uh, he pr preferred to proceed by way of culture rather than by way of explosion. Mm, and uh, uh, he retained uh, the no in his works of late 60s and the 70s, he retained the idea of the cultural language. However, uh, he emphasized that there is a that the plurality of cultural languages is uh, there, are, uh, there are not simply many of them, but they are heterogeneous, they are different in structure. And so each moment of their uh, touching each other, each moment of translation from one language to the other uh, means not simply recording, but interference. Um, out of which unpredictable um, blendings, unpredictable superimpositions of different uh, of different semiotics values happens, and thus <clears throat> this is how the new meaning arises. The the genuinely new, uh, new uh, meaning I reiterate, which you could not recalculate according to the postulates, the structural postulates of your, of your code. The code is there, but when the codes collide and come in touch and translate each other, then you know, the um, unpredictable uh, effects of these collisions uh, arise as the new, um, as the new meaning. <clears throat> Culture can exist as one monolithic language, Lotman iterated. There, there needs to be at least two languages. His examples, by, uh, by the way, uh, usually went with two languages. And the uh, interaction between two uh, sets of semiotics values, although in principle there is, of course, it, it is of course a plural um, process. So at least two languages. Why? 
yeah, at least two languages, because uh, the, uh, the crucial thing is not the implementation of a language itself, but how this implementation uh, gets into touch and interferes with in implementations of another diver diverse, different cultural language and what effects are um, emerging on the intersection. <coughs> Um, I must say that even in uh, the, the, in Lotman's uh, strictly structuralist works of the sixties, so the lectures on uh, uh, on the structure uh, on structural poetics and so forth, uh, and in his lectures, of course, which we um, um, so many of us uh, remember, and he. Uh, while, try, while abiding theoretically to the structuralist model, always um, uh, altered it, uh, actually, by his uh, famous uh, unexpected examples, uh, improvised deviations, asides, uh, and uh, that, that, of course, provided the room uh, some kind of breathing into his uh, structuralist expostulation. But it went uh, actually against the grain of the premises of the radical structuralist model. He struggled with this, even in his early work. Now, uh, this kind of, interfer of interference, of deviation, of collisions, of something unexpected uh, being intruding, intruding uh, the uh, semiotic process has become uh, not simply an accident of performance, so to say, as it was in the 60s, uh, but became a, um, uh, became a theoretical, uh, theoretical position, uh, uh, an explicitly articulated approach. But this, uh, this situation poses yet another problem uh, while resolving uh, the, the problem of uh, the, the arising of new, the production of a new meaning, it poses a new problem, namely, if these forces are indeed unpredictable, if <clears throat> you never can say you know, what uh, different semiotic domains would come in touch with each other and what would happen out of that touch. Yeah. If, it, if it is unregulated and unpredictable, then how they are not falling apart altogether, how they would not um, just dissolve and uh, just cease to be a, a cultural body. Now, uh, used by people. Yeah, uh, uh, I uh, return to the idea of the death of the author, um, the, uh, Roland Barthes' idea, um, uh, under, to, under which, according to which, there is no big problem at all. Um, okay, uh, everything dissolves, there is no unity. <clears throat> And unity is created each time anew by one or another interpreter. There are so many uh, newly assembled semiotic worlds as there are uh, interpreting minds. That is, the death of the author signified the total and absolute uh, triumph of the critic, of the interpreter. Um, and uh, this uh, idea of the prevalence of, sub, of the subject, of the interpreting subject over uh, the body of culture, or, or, over the substance of culture, uh, remained unacceptable uh, for uh, Lotman's work. So the question of, um, of the uh, holding together, consolidating force in culture should uh, 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 needed to be answered um, in order to maintain the idea of unpredictability and heterogeneity. Uh, that Lotman was concerned with this problem is uh, attested uh, very eloquently 
by his last book, uh, Culture and Explosion, Kultura i Vzrev, because uh, there uh, he um, envisions the, uh, the situation in which this, uh, this colliding uh, and uh, forces, this incessant commotion uh, of uh, the interplay of semiotic domains would eventually come to a stalemate uh, which is unable to sustain, to hold itself together. And so the explosion would be the only solution which would, uh, uh, which would allow the process of accumulation and consolidation start once again. After the explosion, the new, uh, the new incarnation, the new phases of culture begins. Uh, yeah, uh, fine, uh, but uh, putting the question of the major crisis of explosion, like what we seem to experience just today, uh, put it aside. How this, uh, this work uh, goes in a positive way within culture itself, how these forces do not fall apart immediately. You know, I, I, I wrote the book on Saussure uh, the, based on uh, his, uh, his manuscript sources and Saussure tormented himself with this the idea he realized that the idea of structural lung is one thing, but the life of the lung uh, uh, appears in speech, and speech is uncontrollable. Nobody has uh, total command on how speech would develop. And Saussure realized that under these conditions, the lung, the structure, wouldn't hold a fraction of a second, which with each speech act, it would be, uh, each speech act would tear it apart. So what, what is uh, holding the system, um, even as a dynamic, uh, volatile, uh, transient uh, state, but still a state in which we, see, we feel that we are within a certain cultural body. And this is, of course, um, what has been answered by uh, the concept of dialogism, out of which the idea of semisphere, uh, semisphere happened. Um, that uh, there is uh, this, uh, this commotion of different semiotic bodies is not arbitrary. It is driven by the need to communicate. The culture is built on our need to externalize our thought to others, to communicate it imperfectly with unpredictable secondary effects as it is, but we still are striving to address ourselves, to address uh, our semiotic values outside to the world of other. And so this dialogical communicative attractions um, is what, what is keeping, uh, at least for a while, um, be, be, before a major uh, crisis erupts, uh, are keeping uh, the culture moving all the time, moving in different directions, but still remaining uh, at large, remaining a consolidated body. This is my, uh, my understanding of uh, the uh, core of Lotman's idea of semiosphere. <clears throat> you live in this semiosphere as an intellectual environment, you exploit it, you alter it, you even destroy, abuse, you, you abuse it, but still it is an environment and you more or less, more or less uh, care ab about surviving within, uh, that, uh, within that environment. Uh, I put this historical perspective to just uh, project um, Lotman's uh, thought uh, on what happened um, in about two, uh, so, uh, 200 years early in 1790s, and mostly in German culture uh, at that time, although it very soon uh, became all European movement. 
Um, 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 the uh, 1790s uh, in Germany and in Europe uh, at large was a time of great intellectual commotion and anxiety. It was created by two um, by, uh, revolutionary events, uh, Kant's critical philosophy and French Revolution. Uh, Kant's critical philosophy exposed the boundaries of cognition by reason. Uh, it showed that reason proceeds uh, to the world, not directly, but uh, via the categories inbuilt in its constitution and cannot go beyond, uh, beyond the param parameters, uh, parameters outlined by those categories. <clears throat> Kant himself <clears throat> meant this as um, putting reason and cognition by reason uh, on a firm foundation. And he spoke about the end of what he called dreams of metaphysics, by which he meant the unqualified, uh, unconditional faith in the power of reason to cognize and understand under which the aid of the age of reason, the 17th and 18th century, the age of Descartes and French enlightenment proceeded. The, uh, there, is, there is no impediment in reason to step by step to conquer the world cognitively, helping, uh, getting in touch with understanding of the world in its entirety with understanding of God's design of the world as, uh, uh, as that was put uh, in the language of the, uh, of the age. Now Kant said that there, there, there is this, uh, this borders, this, uh, uh, these boundaries uh, beyond which reason cannot, uh, cannot go. And for the next generation, the generation of the 90s, uh, it was uh, perceived like uh, some kind of verdict over the limits of human, uh, human reason to find uh, the place uh, to, uh, to cognize the world, to understand the world in its entirety and to understand its place of it. Suddenly uh, people felt, felt intellectually homeless. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we proceed only uh, under this, uh, the auspices of these uh, categories within, uh, then we, uh, what we are doing is the idle manipulation uh, within uh, building a system that has no value but the system, mm, uh, but the system itself. Uh, let me show you uh, some... Um, uh, words on, of Schlegel on this effect. So, uh, so this is uh, the the title, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> What Friedrich Schlegel said on the categorical uh, categorical approach to cognition, the <clears throat> Non-cognizability of the absolute, that is of the essence that stands beyond those categories, is a tautological triviality. You just repeat yourself, it is, it is the tautological manipulation with the, within the prescribed boundaries. He uh, expressed his scorn uh, to the system, uh, system bound cognition by saying a regiment of soldiers on a parade is according to some philosophers way of thinking a system. He means Kant's epigons who, uh, who were busy uh, in um, affirming uh, the uh, categories of critique, uh, critique of, uh, of pure reason. Novalis uh, Schlegel's uh, associate um, in that critique um, of uh, the, the systemic premises had uh, said that philosophers who accept unconditionally the systemic limitations uh, work 
uh, like uh, like shoemaker making uh, making his shoes they work just step by step systematically uh, without any dilemma any unexpected uh, any uh, open ended um, element in that it's not uh, not exactly just but uh, this uh, this was a, a mood uh, largely shared by uh, by uh, philosophers uh, by the by the philosophical community at at the time french revolution added to that by um, eventually initially raising the hope of uh, establishing the um, rational principles of social and moral um, values in the society and then tra transforming itself it's uh, in such monstrous and unpredictable way that it undermined the uh, again undermined the face that we do have uh, a firm moral ground uh, the, the unshakable uh, moral values on which we can uh, rely on uh, unshakable conditions of the justice uh, of the social justice mm, in, and so forth and so homeless um, uh, and uh, the philosophical uh, thought of the, the 90s was uh, 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 was striving to get uh, to get the escape from uh, this prison from this stalemate uh, in which uh, they saw themselves um, put by the uh, critical uh, philosophers uh, the person um, who uh, came out uh, with the um, most radical solution and there were several major um, major philosophical um, ideas of the time um, i will just name uh, names leonard uh, Rein, uh, reinhold was a very influential at, 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 at that time philosopher at jena Mm, and the, who first proposed the premises of subject-oriented idealist philosophical approach. Schiller played a seminal role by bringing aesthetic element as, uh, as the firm ground uh, on which we can approach the world aesthetically. But the most powerful figure uh, was um, uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte, uh, whose uh, Wissenschaftslehre, as he called it, proclaimed the way, as he saw, as he saw it, of going away from uh, Kant's statement. And uh, this way, as uh, as Fichte envisaged, uh, envisioned it, was um, to rely on the subject's self-consciousness. Reason, the abstract reason, has its boundaries. Fichte accepted, but the awareness of, of a subject of its existence is absolute and unconditioned, unconditional. Uh, Fichte um, put it uh, in a way of, uh, of his first postulate of, uh, of his teaching, uh, which he formulated as Ich bin ich, I am I. Interestingly enough, this is the paraphrases of paraphrases of the word Yahweh uh, says to Moses to uh, in Genesis uh, when Moses asks him uh, uh, what or who uh, uh, the God is. Uh, the Yahweh re remains, I am what I am. So ich bin ich, and so. Uh, the subject is absolutely sure that he is here, and uh, here is his uh, cognitive, uh, his intellectual world. And so from this firm position, absolute position, he starts to appropriate the outside world, uh, considering it as the world of nicht-ich. It's something uh, which which lays outside of of me uh, the uh, the subject makes a step in, in taking some of this nicht ich to, uh, to his understanding 
it becomes appropriated and then the new uh, the new problem opens and so forth the movement of the subject in appropriating the world is infinite but um, but what is constant is the subject assurance that he does it his will to cognite his consciousness of itself as the center of interpretation of cognition is unshakable and absolute Schlegel and uh, his uh, friend Novalis and their associates in the Jena Romantic Circle uh, first embraced Fichte's uh, revolution and Fichte was often uh, compared, uh, Fichte's theory was often compared to the French Revolution in, in philosophy. Uh, they embraced it enthusiastically, but, uh, but soon they became aware that this revolution, while breaking from the uh, confines of Kant's, Kantian's categories, by bringing the absolute element to the relation between the human mind and the world, at the same time did it at the expense of giving dictatorial power to the mind. The mind um, is proceeding from the awareness that this is I, this is what I'm doing. Um, uh, in uh, Kantian terms, the triumph of the critic um, over, over the substance. Uh, Schlegel um, uh, very sharply um, uh, spoke about the easiness with which uh, uh, this uh, self-centered uh, self-centered cognizing I appropriate the world uh, removing or explaining away any substantial different difficulties which can uh, come to uh, to his way and actually not not being much interested in substantial uh, uh, substantial matter and um, let me uh, show uh, what Friedrich Schlegel said about Fichte. If one is allowed to set the absolute at will, that is by its subjective will, then nothing could be easier than to explain anything. He has no interest whatsoever in any technical or historical matter. Show him anything you like. He will just smile and resolve, illuminate, annihilate your objection with the childish easiness by means of his talisman. Fichte is the Pope of philosophy, uh, uh, Schlegel continues, who possesses the infallible power to open and close heaven and hell with his key. This idea of the interpret interpreting subject, having a magic key with which everything uh, can be open, opened. When, Fichte, when Schlegel in first wave of enthusiasm approached Fichte, they were friends. Um, uh, saying uh, how wonderful his philosophy applies to historical, uh, to history of culture. Schlegel responded that he would rather count beans than care about history. Indeed, he didn't care about history. Uh, he, uh, uh, what, what he cared was this interpreting um, uh, subject. And this is uh, the situation. Um, yeah, uh, 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 Novalis, and on his part, um, yeah, uh, in view of, of the catastrophic development of French Revolution, um, uh, 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 suggested that uh, Fichte should be given the title, the uh, first, uh, the, uh, 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 the member of the Directoire, uh, of the French Directoire, and later First Consul. So this Napoleonic, uh, Napoleonic figure mm, of Fichte. So the response of the, the, the response by uh, by the Jena circle uh, was the mm, the way they tried to navigate between the confines of a systemic approach on the one hand and the unrestrained subjectivity of the eye-centered 
approach on the other, uh, of uh, Fichte and the idealist philosopher on the other. Their idea was that the cognizing force is indeed the subject, as Fichte asserts, not the prescribed system, but the subject with all mobility and unpredictability of the train of its soul. However, it is not the subject alone, the subject who is godlike put against the entire world as it is, um, it is suggested by Fichte. Uh, the subject is plural. There are um, um, an infinite number of cognizing minds which are in relation to each other. The subject's thought is always affected by his, uh, on the one hand, his, uh, his desire to make his thought uh, articulated for the sake of others. And on the other hand, it is, it is affected by other voice, the voices of others invading, interfering, meddling with, uh, with this subject's thought. No, no one has a luxury to be left alone one-on-one -on -one with the train of his interpreting mind. Um, uh, the moment one uh, starts think about any matter, the voices of the other uh, entered in, uh, enter into it, invade it. They complement uh, his thought, but at the same time, they deflect it. Uh, they made, uh, they made uh, pr provide discontinuity. They provide contradictions. In um, in other word, uh, in other words, uh, the uh, the world of the subject is the world of uh, of plural. It is the world of intersubjectivity in which um, everyone um, ex uh, everyone. Uh, with uh, one's uh, interpreting mind enters the space um, the, the, the space of multiple efforts by many others. This is the way, the dialogical way, uh, we would say uh, in modern terms, uh, to overcome uh, the limits of the prescribed structural framework on the one hand and of the unbounded power of the subject uh, which uh, the which keeps us uh, keeps aside the body the substance um, of cognition and for a grounds uh, to, gives the total prevalence to the inter, to the subjective interpretation okay mm, yeah, I, I call this uh, uh, this uh, phenomenon worked out by um, Jena uh, romantics mostly by uh, Schlegel and Novalis, intersubjectivity. The, the subject in, in constant interaction with others. Okay, uh, Schlegel coined a name uh, some philosophizing, some philosophy uh, to explain uh, his personal uh, interaction with Novalis and at the same time um, uh, to use it as a universal, uh, universal uh, term uh, which uh, describes the interactional, the dialogical character of human mind and human cognition. I would say that what on the language of the 1790s, on the language of the classical philosophy was called cognition, the mind, uh, representation of thought and source uh, in terms of semiotics of the late 20th century um, uh, was called culture, cultural language, uh, cultural performance, um, cultural phenomena, representations, and so there's, there's a clear parallel between these two. Okay, mm, so mm, the, the, the Navalis uh, uh, openly defying uh, Fichte's formula, foundational formula, Ich bin Ich, responded to it with his own foundational formula, Ich bin du, I am you. That is, uh, I sense myself, I understand my own, 
my own thought only by being projected, externalized to and seen in the mirror of responses and contributions of others. Mm. To conclude, what kind of um, um, what, uh, what, uh, to conclude, I would like to make two points uh, in regard to uh, the, this juxtaposition uh, between the beginnings of Romanticism and the Lotman response to the structural model and to its post-structural demise um, of the 70s. One point is, of course, uh, quite obvious that it provides the um, historical uh, perspective to Lotman's thought. Uh, his idea uh, evolved um, from uh, efforts, his personal efforts and efforts of the uh, scholarly body of the, of the time to, um, to navigate between this dilemma, this system, and the subjective in uh, the subjectivity, the subjective interpreter, how to become open, how to bro uh, bring uh, the break away from the com confines of the system, and at the same time, not to turn to arbitrariness and willfulness uh, of subjective interpretation. It is <clears throat> the same problem uh, with which early Romanticism, uh, the uh, Jena Romantic Circle, tried to navigate between Kant's categorical um, definition of reason on the one hand, and the, it, the response to it by German idealist philosophy, beginning with Fichte, Rheingold actually and Fichte on the other. They didn't deny either. They accepted the categorical foundation of reason. They accepted the um, uh, subjective consciousness, but they, um, uh, they navigated, I repeat, between them by making the subjective uh, consciousness plural and dialogical. Um, uh, so this uh, historical background, um, I believe, is helpful in understanding not only the uh, content of Lockman's concept, concepts, but the um, mental evolution, the inner evolution that had led to their formulation, um, their full formulation in late 80s. The second point, um, uh, the, uh, which I uh, mentioned, uh, at least at which I uh, hinted in my in the beginning of my lecture, uh, concerns the um, uh, situation which I believe the Yin Romantics emphasized more strongly than uh, Lotman in his concept of semiosphere, and which again may be helpful in understanding some implicit consequences of Lockman's theory. Um, it is that the dialogism, that the sum, uh, sum philosophizing, the intersubjectivity, means not only cooperation, not only the dialogical mutual contributions, but it also means interference, contradiction, deflection, discontinuities. That other thoughts are mm, other voices uh, uh, enter your space dialogically, but uh, they enter it in unpredictable way. The, the other people's mind are un not under your control. You cannot predict what kind of deflection, what kind of side effects to your thought would be produced by appearance of this, uh, of this voices of the other. And you cannot shake off the voices of the other. Every, uh, every step in your thought brings uh, these associations, which uh, these voices from the outside mm, in, your, in your mind. So this conflicting, contrarian, explosive-like aspect of the, mm, uh, of the cognitive work, of the semiotic uh, interpretation of semiotic values uh, is as important for the dialogical mm, 
principle uh, as the cooperation and consolidating uh, consolidating mutual desire to comprehend and understand um, uh, uh, this means that actually um, there is no uh, binary opposition between culture and explosion one can say that culture is explosion it proceeds simultaneously by contradicting itself and by consolidating and cooperating. Uh, I wish to end my lecture with uh, the um, words again by Friedrich Schlegel, which concluded um, the collective uh, series of fragments, the famous Ateneum fragments. Ateneum was a journal of the Jena Circle. They published the series of anonymous of Ateneum of fragments, 451 fragments altogether, the enormous in the collection. Uh, the very genre of uh, fragments emphasize this chaotic and the discontinual nature of the dialogical uh, the dialogical ex exchange and here is the fragment number uh, 451 in which the concluding in which Schlegel explains what he understands by romantic consciousness yeah uh, sorry Yeah, here it is. It is close to the goal of harmony, but remains forever unaccomplished, an uninterrupted chain of inner revolutions. It is genuine polytheism and carries in itself the whole Olymp. So, uh, uh, to uh, Barth's death of uh, death of the author and as we probably know, probably remember Bart uh, drew, drew parallel death of the author and death of uh, death of God proclaimed by uh, by Nietzsche but it is uh, to this Schlegel uh, seems to be responding by proclaiming the polytheism the Olympian uh, Olympian deity as the answer uh, to this dilemma. In another, um, uh, another fragment, he compares the, the poly, the, this um, polymorphous plural consciousness with the republican cognitive order, in which the, uh, the content arises out of, uh, out of contribution, but also collision, disagreement of dialogical voices uh, participating in the process. Thank you, and I hope that we have a little time, and I would be more than happy uh, to speak uh, with the audience when uh, the time will come for me to appear um, on your screen, not in recording, uh, but uh, in uh, in the live performance in four days. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Gasparov, and. For, for this wonderful and, I would say, crucial talk, uh, uh, for us being in the situation of explosion, a real explosion, unfortunately. So now the, uh, Professor Gasparov is online and everybody can ask him the questions. Please, uh, speak to, speak into, into the microphone. Here is... Thanks a lot, Professor Gasparov. Uh, of course, uh, you, your presentation provides a lot of things for food. And may I ask you two, maybe in some respect, provocative questions. First of all, about explosion and culture. Of course, we can speak about explosive revolutionary mechanism of culture. However, in Lotman, you can find the opposite way of thinking about evolutionary and reconciliation of oppositions. Is the other point of view and how it is possible to oh, reconcile or synthesize with uh, your talk. And my second question about 
situational communication. Of course, you are absolutely right. Lotman insists on the necessity of the other cognition because otherwise it is impossible to communicate. It, there is no interest to speak with myself. But at the same time, he elaborated and in very deeply the other model communication. I, I, yeah, yeah, or I, uh, me. Uh, and there are the other mechanism of communication which is, provides the other type of the cognition. Uh, and please comment these uh, uh, ideas of Lotman and how it coincides with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Both, both questions I greatly appreciate. And, and let me uh, let me say in the beginning that uh, four days ago, when I was taping this lecture, I did it just uh, one hour after receiving the news about the Russian tanks crossing the border of Ukraine. Um, and um, I, I'm sorry if I if I sometimes so sounded not as uh, as clear as I. May I would, would like to, my mind was really swimming at, uh, at that point. Uh, uh, among other things, I recall uh, the August of 1968 and invasion of Czechoslovakia and how it was felt in Tartu, in Tartu circles. And by the way, I want to, sorry about this back, background noise. Um, I want to say that this crisis, this deep moral crisis of 1968-69 uh, was um, a part of the new wave of thinking and rethinking the structural model. And um, it turned in, uh, as, as early as, as, and, as in 69. Do you hear me? I'm sorry, there is... Okay. Well, uh, one, uh, just, just one minute, it, it, will pass, it will pass over it's behind my, my window, very, very unfortunate. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so, the 69 was exactly the year when Lotman started coming out with this revolutionary new ideas. Um, I, I, I believe that this moral crisis, which we all lived at that time, was a part of it. And um, this is the answer or, uh, the, to your first question, I believe, that um, this kind of explosion uh, out of uh, out of the destructive forces which tears um, tears apart our fabric of thinking and of self consciousness, out of them um, comes new uh, consolidating uh, effort, and we cannot uh, divide uh, uh, these two processes. That. Uh, uh, precisely because the culture is polymorphous, it consists of so many different voices. At one uh, at one moment, uh, at one point, and one nodal point of uh, of this cultural network of voices, uh, it, it, uh, you see the, the the destruction, and at another, at, at the same time, it turns into uh, into something new. It is exactly that. Uh, uh, this kind of disruptive element is uh, the uh, true consequence of the um, multiple, uh, uh, multi-actional character of, uh, of culture, the multiplicity of agents working on it simultaneously and working independently of each other, not controlling each other. Uh, creating all uh, kind of these effects. I, I believe that uh, Schlegel and Navalis theory of uh, multiple subjects and intersubjectivity can elucidate certain moments of the concept of uh, culture uh, and explosion in this respect. Yeah. Then one, uh, then eye to eye communication. Yes, Novalis specifically addresses this question uh, very uh, in detail uh, in his uh, 
uh, now classical uh, work, critical work on Fichte. And he considers it an inner dialogue in which uh, I, uh, uh, these two eyes are different. And they are different because, not because you, uh, as, as a controlling subject, um, uh, make them uh, just the roles in the theater. No, they are different in a, in a more profound way that, that because this I1 and I2 are included in different networks of uh, intersubjectivity. They are um, invaded, they um, are uh, simultaneized with different voices from outside. And so this inner dialogue inevitably turns into an outer an outer dialogue between these multiple multiple agents which stands at the background of each of the dialogic parties even in this eye and eye communication i think this uh, this can respond uh, this uh, uh, this facet of uh, lotman's theory Thank you very much. And we have still time for some more questions. So, Marek Tam, you are welcome. For this truly illuminating lecture, I have uh, two interrelated small questions. First, can we conclude from your presentation that Yuri Lotman was a romantic thinker? And, and I tend to agree, but then here comes the second question. You pointed out very well the importance of the German Romanticist uh, thinking for Lottmann, especially Novalis Schlegel, but maybe also Goethe. But what about German rationalist thinking? I have in mind especially the, I think, importance of Leibniz and Immanuel Kant for Lottmann's thinking. So, would you agree that, that Lottmann can be also considered as a uni very unique and original combination of German romanticist and German rationalist thinking? Thank you. Very interesting, thank you. Um, well, um, the, the very important distinction which um, needs to be done is between Romanticism and early Romanticism. What uh, in the modern uh, scholarly terminology is called pre-romantic. Uh, the term introduced by Lacoulabart and Nancy and uh, Manfred Frank in, uh, in Germany in the 70s and now widely accepted in regard to the early romantic circles of the late uh, 18th century of the 1990s, uh, uh, Schlegel, Novalis and the Ateneum, Ateneum circle uh, uh, first of all but also Germain de Stahl and um, her circle, uh, Benjamin Constant, uh, in France, Switzerland, Wordsworth and Coleridge in England, and of course, Helderlin, who was alone, uh, never went to any uh, sta uh, stable cooperation. Mm, yeah, the early Romantics, they are very different from uh, what we know as high Romanticism of 1910s, 1920s. Uh, for one thing, they didn't quarrel with the classics. Schlegel was, uh, Schlegel's theory came out of his studies of classical literature, and Schiller even, Schiller even wrote parodies uh, about uh, Schlegel. Schlegel's Greco-mania and so forth. And second, they were not uh, people um, uh, opposite to enlightenment. Uh, they were people who grew out of the crisis of, of the enlightenment and, uh, tr and tried to find a positive response, a creative response to the revision of values of deep uh, intellectual and moral values of enlightenment, uh, which was signified, as, as, I say, as I said, first of all, by Kant's uh, critique uh, the, of, uh, of reason. Um, Kant, of course, was purely the person of enlightenment, and so he meant his critique as uh, setting the reason on the right, uh, on the right footing. Uh, but uh, the, the, the generation of the 90s, beginning with the Fichte, uh, started, uh, took it as a necessity to take uh, 
to find new resources in culture, in human consciousness that uh, would, uh, uh, would find a solution to the um, limitation, to borderlines set by the critical philosopher. In this, in this sense, we can say that Fichte is a pure romantic. He just break through, break away uh, from the system um, uh, brought in by Kant by will. But Schlegel and Navalis are uh, more complex. They are they are vacillating so, so, or navigating between the tradition which comes from Leibniz and Descartes. Uh, and um, to which uh, Kant brought drastic revisions in this setting the framework within the Cartesian the Cartesian system of mind uh, of rational mind is working and between and between the um, purely romantic I would say will to just in one leap Turn, uh, turn apart all these limitations and assert uh, the individual subjective consciousness. They were in between. And in this respect, I would say that I see Yuri Mikhailovich as a person deeply committed to the ideas of enlightenment and uh, ideals of enlightenment and to the tradition of rationalism. This is how he readily, he, the historian, um, which he was from the very beginning, readily embraced uh, the promises of universal uh, model, uh, rational model of describing culture that were offered by early structuralism by the Jacobsonian semiotics. But at the same time, he felt this kind of worry and um, the sobriety in, in, in sensing limitations of this uh, matter. But um, he tries to, uh, to find a solution to these problems, not on the way of subjectivity and the triumphant critical interpretationist stance, but on the way of history. And this is, I, I think, uh, I, I dare say that to my uh, respect, uh, to my view, Lotman has something of the early romantics. Mm, uh, to, uh, to bring in the Russian analogy, I think that to some extent it can be said to Karamzin, this kind of uh, intellectual profile can be applied to Karamzin and to early Arzamasians, the first generation of the, of the Arzamasians. This is, uh, to my view, uh, uh, Yuri Lotman's true intellectual home. Thank you once more. It was really wonderful to have you here with us also virtually, but, but still it was really fascinating. Thank you and let us give one applaud. Thank you. Thank you. I am very happy. Uh, and, and now I, I have some practical remarks to everybody. So now there will be another tour to uh, Radi Cemetery, and uh, your, uh, the tour will be guided by Roman Wojtychowicz. Please stand up. And uh, so the bus will leave f from Jacobi II. It's the, the next uh, next to the main building. If you go out, then to the right. But then at uh, we can immediately have at 1315 uh, lunch at the University Coffee House, which is again next to the name main building, but to the left. And also I have one important announcement that we will have the bus which will bring us from uh, the main building to up to the hill in uh, Tome when the uh, festive ceremony will end. Because we, everybody can, uh, probably not all would like to climb up the hill, so the buses will bring us there. So thank you very much for, for the attention and uh, so. In some hour, we'll meet here again for the lecture of Professor Boris Uspensky. <laughs>